Uh, yeah, I guess this lecture is going to be more broadly than uh, on QML than my abstract, uh, which is good for students uh, because it's less focused on particular work and, and more about the, the big picture and the, the whole theory. Um, great. So I'm mostly going to talk about hybrid quantum classical networks uh, and, uh, you know, the theory, uh, a bit of the intuition behind uh, why we think quantum deep learning will be an interesting theory and, you know, why, uh, why we think quantum computers are going to be useful in, in, in deep learning in general. Um, so you see my, my, my whole screen or do you see this little tab of the video? You know, that's just, yep, so. I see a full screen. Plus we can see your cursor as well. So if you want to, that's point. good, right. There's also a pointer feature here and that's better. There you go. All right. So understanding deep learning representations. So various people have, uh, you know, various uh, kind of TLDRs about deep learning. What, what is deep learning? Is it learning a, I, I would say personally, I would say it is learning compressed representations. So compression is finding an interesting subspace or an interesting sub manifold of a certain input space, right? So for example, we've had <clears throat> variational autoencoders, they're, uh, they're kind of a neural network where you, you have, let's say, an image space and you have this neural network that is trying to compress and decompress an image and it, it goes to a, a lower dimensional space and you force it to bottleneck and you force it to fit it a nice distribution that's uncorrelated in the latent space, right? It's like if I... Um, yeah, I have a network of pipes and eventually I just want all my signals to be uncorrelated in the, in the central zone. And when, when you do that, uh, you're, you're forced to kind of learn the transformation that, that goes from your distribution of your data to a simple distribution, a trivial distribution of uncorrelated variables. And so when you run it in reverse, you go from those uncorrelated variables back to, back to the visible space. You've just found the transformation or the layers of computation that go from a simple distribution to the target distribution. This is similar to in quantum compute computation, you start with a tensor product of various states that are uncorrelated, and then you apply layers of quantum circuits. And then at the output of the quantum circuit, you have an interesting uh, distribution, right? So whether you, you phrase it one way where it's, it's kind of to take uh, a certain distribution and decode it, find a, a subspace uh, whether it's an uncorrelated subspace or a hidden subspace with a hidden parameter you're trying to estimate, e.g., <clears throat> is it a picture of a cat or a dog, right? That's a, that's a weird subspace and you can't, it's not a linear transformation. It's a highly nonlinear transformation. So that's more like classifiers. Uh, that's, that's roughly the intuition that we should have about what is deep learning. Deep learning is, is studying representations. Representations are you can think of them as multi-step or deep representations as multi-step computations to, you know, either compress or regenerate uh, a certain distribution, uh, your data. Um, and so thinking like that, you know, how, how are we going to apply this to, to quantum uh, computing? Right. Uh, I think this is uh, more of what I've, uh, I've been saying here. Uh, What's cool is that uh, when you go to latent space uh, and you have a compressed representation, uh, then you can do vector algebra in latent space. And uh, you, you really have uh, kind of uh, somewhat of a semantic understanding of, of your space of images. And so, you know, what if, what if, what if we could do this for, for quantum uh, simulation, right? That would be interesting, right? Like maybe one direction is superconductivity, another direction is is uh, you know resistivity or whatnot, and uh, you could you could play around in latent space. Um, similarly, uh, for classifiers, again, classifiers you could think of as I compress first, and then from that compressed representation, I can extract different clusters for different data points, right? Because, like we said, you know, let's say I learn in unsupervised fashion this image space. I have the age vector, I have the glasses vector, and so on. And then I have a classifier, is there glasses or not? Then I could just simply uh, read it out from that compressed representation. So you could do unsupervised pre-training. So that's why, you know, focusing on unsupervised ML, <clears throat> you also get as a byproduct, 
supervised machine learning kind of like techniques could be tacked on um, if you have a good, strong, unsupervised machine learning method, which allows you to learn a decompressed or uh, sorry, a, a compressed representation or decorrelated representation uh, of your input uh, space in your data. Uh, <clears throat> so there are a couple things uh, you know you want in a good representation. You want your representation to have enough capacity. So you know the computation you're doing uh, through a, a neural network or a, a quantum circuit to be you know co complex enough to to either generate or or uncompute in a sense the data set, right? You want it to be tractable to train, right? And 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 uh, training relatively fast and you want it to be tractable to run inference or, or sampling right which is not just tweaking the parameters of your network but to to sample uh from the network to to predict prediction step the word inference in uh, bayesian versus uh, uh deep learning is is there's debates about that what it should mean but uh here i'm using inference like prediction um and Last but not least, the whole point of uh, learning as opposed to uh, optimization is to have generalization. So to generalize to instances that are out of the, the data set. Um, so again, the representation capacity is like if you have the, the cat and dog, you know, sub manifolds of, of pixel space, they're all, you know, it's hard, it's hard to tell. They're kind of superposed on one, one another. I mean, uh, you know, it's in the same image space. And then through several uh, transformations, you can get, um, you can get, uh, yeah, you can get uh, a separation of these two classes, these two sub-manifolds. Um, okay. So that, that's an important thing. That's, that's something we want for, for quantum machine learning. If we're going to have a good classifier or if we're going to have a generative model for some data, we need to be able to, you know, you can't necessarily learn everything with a single uh, layer uh, quantum circuit, right? Uh, some things are going to take more complexity. Some things are going to take less complexity. But then in the quantum case, as we'll see, there's quantum complexity, and then there's going to be classical complexity um, uh, and, and in a hybrid model. And we'll see how we could split the two. <clears throat> so. When it comes to learning performance, right, we want, we want a heuristic algorithm that typically gives you quote unquote good enough results, right? And it's still being, it's still an active area of study in classical machine learning. Why do deep, uh, you know, super deep uh, networks with a lot, a lot, a lot of par parameters initialize with Gaussians? Why can you train them with stochastic gradient descent? It's like unreasonably effective. Um, but, you know, it's going to depend on the landscape and the dynamics, the, 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 the kind of uh, uh, dynamics you're inducing via your, your optimization algorithm. Uh, and, you know, if you look at uh, deep neural networks, if you don't do uh, techniques which are called regularization techniques, which kind of smooth things out, uh, in your landscape, for example, uh, you know, dropout and whatnot, uh, then you have a very jagged landscape. So you can imagine if I'm going down these hills, it's, uh, it's easy to get lost in a crevice, but in, in this bowl, it's, it's quite easy to just go all the way down with gradient descent, right? With some momentum. Uh, so the idea is this is going to depend on how you're parameterizing things, your data sets. It's going to depend on uh, you know, how you're initializing things and it's going to depend on your choice of optimizer. So that's actually a thing uh, that used to be my focus for quantum neural networks, uh, training efficiency. And there's all sorts of works uh, in this space, but you know, there, there is a, a problem uh, with quantum neural networks in, in this aspect, at least the ones that are typically used for the NISC era, the so-called hardware efficient onsets. And we'll get back to that. Inference tractability. This is a big one. Um, you know, if you have a model, I could, I could give you a complicated model that like, okay, well, if you can achieve <clears throat> this, um, this distribution to parameterize in this way, let's say the thermal state of a complicated Boltzmann machine, right? Um, then it's, 
it's not necessarily uh, straightforward to, to sample from that state, right? It is in itself, just doing the prediction, not just the training is itself an optimization procedure and or, or a sampling procedure and that has to be tractable. Similarly, if I give you a, a deep quantum neural network or a deep random quantum neural network, a deep circuit, right? And it's in the post uh, quantum supreme, uh, whatever you want to call it, regime, right? It's, it's beyond the depth uh, at which you could classically simulate it, then you can't run inference or, or prediction on a classical computer and you need a quantum computer, right? So the idea is that using quantum models, right, or models that incorporate quantum layers, now that we have bigger and bigger quantum computers over time, we're gonna have new models that we could run the prediction step or run the inference step with that we couldn't before. We could parameterize them before, but we couldn't check their output, right? So that opens up new possibilities and the point of quantum deep learning is to uh, explore what are those uh, possibilities. Uh, and finally, you know, generalization power. Uh, I won't go too much into this. This is like standard uh, machine learning theory. The idea is that you have a data set and then you have data points that are in this, you know, outside your data set and you want to make sure, let's say if you fit, you know, cat and dog uh, classification, if you have a new picture of a cat and you've never seen, it still works. And in general, um, you want to make sure you, you don't go uh, too far down the gradient uh, descent landscape with your original um, uh, data set so that you don't overfit. Uh, because if you over optimize for your data set, then you're going to stop optimizing for the, you know, the unseen examples. So that's the difference between training and testing. Testing is when you, you, you give it examples it hasn't seen. So there's usually a sweet spot uh, in modern theory uh, with over parameterized networks. Uh, there's a, a new phenomenon I, I just wanted to mention uh, that is double descent. That is this weird kind of uh, curve that uh, if your network is over parameterized, it ends up working, which uh, that's, that's not something we see in, in QML yet. We don't have uh, massive networks, but it, I just thought I'd, I'd mention it uh, because this, this picture, which is like the textbook picture is starting to, to be adjusted. Um, so this, this is like, you know, a lot of general deep learning theory. Uh, I'm, I'm doing some parallels with, with quantum, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to it. Uh, but it, it's important, you know, a, a lot of people want to do the quantum version of a field without really deeply understanding the classical version. And I would encourage you to always, you know, if you're going to do, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, quantum XYZ, go to XYZ classical and make sure to get at a, a decent level in, in that theory. It's going to, it's going to pay its dividends on the, on the quantum side. Uh, okay. So yeah, representation capacity, right? You know, if I have, as we'll see, if I have entangled data, right, it's, it's hard to sample or, or, or be able to generate or uncompute, you know, highly entangled quantum states classically. So quantum will help with that. Training efficiency, well, you know, we want to make sure our, our quantum onsets or our quantum parameterized models are trainable. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind and we'll see some work in, in, in that uh, area. Inference tractability, we want to make sure, you know, our prediction step is, is tractable and, you know, it, it uses the quantum and the classical computers in a way that uh, they're both uh, comfortable in a sense uh, on their home turf. And generalization power, uh, that, I mean, we won't cover too much, but um, that's an all, also important step. And in general, you know, the, the more you have an efficient description, uh, usually the heuristic is that the more efficient your description of a phenomenon and yet accurate, you know, the higher the likelihood that you've really found kind of the essence of, of the, uh, of the data set. And, uh, in some cases, for example, you know, learning dynamics, uh, if you have a parameterization, that's like a, a quantum time evolution and you know, your data is from a quantum time evolution, then you have a greater chance that it, it generalizes well, if you fit it. And, uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll see that in a second. So, you know, why learn quantum representations? 
uh, you know, Feynman used to say nature isn't classical, damn it. And if you want to make a simulation of nature, you better make it quantum mechanical. But what we like to say is if you want to learn a representation of nature, you'd better make it quantum mechanical. And again, representations are like these multi-step computations that either compress your space or, or generate it uh, when you're doing discriminative or generative modeling, right? So a lot of people are saying, uh, and this is going to be my controversial po portion of the talk, but uh, a lot of people are searching for uh, applications of quantum neural networks that improve classical data representations. And though, you know, there's reasons to expect when you have an optimization procedure, such as inference, uh, type, certain types of inference that are optimization or, or searching over parameter space, you could get a Grover-like speed up. I think that beyond that, I think the exponential uh, speed ups uh, lie in studying quantum data. So learning representations of how to compress or generate or isolate interesting parameters of quantum states and quantum channels and quantum processes, trying to describe quantum things with a quantum model, right? That's the essence of why we built quantum computers. And so to me, that is the essence of where quantum machine learning is going. Uh, and we can have an interesting discussion after the talk on this. I, I know this was a strong statement, but uh, sometimes you just got to say some strong things. Um, Okay, so yeah, so so quantum states, I, I think I've mentioned this a few times now, I was kind of teasing this part, um, but you know, quantum states can have high degrees of entanglement. Uh, it's hard to represent entanglement or large scale entanglement with classical representations, right? Uh, and it, it, it's, it's really the entanglement, which is the problem, right? Because people say, oh, uh, quantum computing lives in an exponential space, but my point is, okay, well, learning a distribution, a classical distribution is also an exponential space. It's also two to the N, it's a, you know, probably distribution. So what's the gap, right? It's, it's more about quantum complexity rather than just living in exponential space. So sometimes some people are say, oh yeah, I'm just gonna bury my stuff in this exponential space. It's big, ergo it's magic. And then cross my fingers, hope that uh, I get a speed up and uh, doesn't really work empirically. Uh, so, so, so the idea is really, you know, we want to, we want to be humble about the capacity of, of quantum machine learning. It's not supposed to replace classical machine learning. It's supposed to supplement it so that we could tackle uh, applications in areas that we couldn't before. Right. Uh, so, you know, we know that certain states that are entangled are hard to replicate, you know, doing a very long chain of coherent evolution, a unitary evolution, uh, is very hard, right? So, so, so that's an example of like, okay, if you had a model like that, and uh, you know, there's been Hamiltonian learning, and we have a, a slight variation on that uh, for a while uh, in, in our work. Um, if you have a model like that, then it has an advantage at the prediction step because you can't sample from it uh, classically. And uh, yeah, I mean, understanding quantum states or quantum uh, uh, or, or parameterizing quantum states or or quantum processes could be exponentially hard. And if you've ever done full quantum state or quantum process tomography, right, you have like, uh, what is it, four to the n uh, different uh, elements to estimate, and it's, it's a mess to parameterize it and hold it in your classical computer. So we need better parameterizations for, for generalization. So, so how do we practically, you know, leverage quantum computations? Well, you know, ideally we play to the strengths of the quantum uh, computations and we add to it the power of classical representations and we find clever ways to hybridize both. Because the reality is that, you know, quantum computers are, you know, when they're going to be error corrected, they're going to be large overhead. And when they're not error corrected, then we can only do small circuits. Uh, and so you're, you're going to want to use quantum sparingly, but you want to use quantum in a way that adds value, but, and it is meaningful, but in, in, in a, you know, very sparingly, right? So, so the idea is you're going to want to hybridize, right? So, so here's an example, a diagram from, from the TensorFlow quantum uh, paper, which is, uh, you know, you prepare a quantum data set, uh, for now you can't import quantum data onto your quantum computer. So you have to prepare it, uh, in situ, you know, 
and then you process it. So you have part of your model, then you measure it and then you can have a, a neural network. So that's an example of like a classifier. And the idea is that, you know, gradient descent is ubiquitous for models that are continuously parameterized. So we want to extend uh, gradient descent to quantum neural networks and classical neural networks and hybrid neural networks. Um, I don't know if I will cover hybrid backprop today, but uh, it is covered in TensorFlow Quantum, and I think you, you've had previous speakers use quantum gradients and so on, so I won't go too much into that. Um, yeah, but you know, the idea is you can hybridize these graphs, you can have a deep neural network before a quantum neural network, and, and so on, you make, make all sorts of crazy networks. Uh, and quantum neural networks, again, I mean, it's, it's an abuse of the language, it's, it's just, you know, <laughs> most things that are parameterized and differentiable and, and you optimize them with gradient descent in the classical space and you make networks out of them. Some people call them neural networks. And so if you have parameterized quantum circuits and uh, you train them with gradient descent or some optimizer, they're continuously parameterized. You could say they're called quantum neural networks, right? Uh, okay. So yeah, I guess hybrid, hybrid backdrop, for example, you know, the idea is that, um, You've all seen the uh, basic variational algorithms where I, I define a Hamiltonian observable, let's say in the VQE, and then I have a parameterized circuit, and then I optimize it with gradient descent, right? The idea is if I have, you know, let's say a, a neural network sandwich like this, you know, I have a neural network, I have a QNN here, quantum neural network, so it feeds the parameters in, and then I read it out, I have several expectation values, and I feed those into another neural network that could do a, a complicated function, and then I have my loss function. I'm trying to take gradients of, then, you know, I could take gradients of this, backpropagate classically through this. I get an effective backpropagated gradient from this backpropagated gradient, okay? This G vector, let's call it Mr. Mr. G here, the, the, the gradient. If I take a dot product between uh, this G vector, this gradient, and these Hamiltonians, in a sense, I'm getting like a first order approximation to, to the operator form of, of this, um, this loss function here. But the point is that I could take gradients of this thing, which is, we call it like an effective gradient backpropagated Hamiltonian. I, I take gradients of this thing, uh, you know, of, of, of this uh, Hamiltonian at the output here. So it's like VQE, it's just a different Hamiltonian. And with respect to these parameters, and then I get the gradient of this thing with respect to these parameters. So I've effectively pushed through a gradient, right? And you could do this for complicated networks uh, arbitrarily. Right, uh, so that's so that's hybrid backprop. That's a way to hybridize quantum and classical, and make sure you're able to have gradients through the whole thing. You know, shameless plug. We have uh, a software framework that does this for you. It uses CERC and TensorFlow, uh, and uh, it's focused on, on on using QPUs and so on. Um, and um, yeah, I, I, I won't uh, plug it further, but check it out. Um, okay, so. Let's be real. Some 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 problems. Um, this is a, from a, the a paper by Jared McLean and, and team. Uh, you know, in the near term, because we're stuck in the NISC era, we're focused on having uh, parameterized quantum circuits that are hardware efficient. So they're they're like they've got a very high density of parameters. You have like random polys, you know, random poly rotations, and and let's say some CZs here and you have alternating layers of this. This is just an example, but it's, it looks a bit like the typical, you know, random circuit or random QNN uh, that you've seen. And the problem with this is that if you take the gradients um, and you look at the variance of the gradients for typical choices of the parameters, right? So if you do um, random choices of the parameters, what's gonna happen is that you have a very low variance of the gradients. So that means that the landscape, the parameter landscape is more or less flat. So you can't, you can't do much better. And the idea is that it's, it's a sign of the no free lunch theorem. The no free lunch theorem says no one um, model could rule them all. No one representation could rule them all, right? You, sh you need to be somewhat biased in your representation and use prior knowledge of what you're studying to, to have a more efficient parameterization. Because if you try to learn the most general map, you're gonna have way too many parameters your data and it's not going to train well. So similarly, if you have a random QNN, not only does, is it highly scrambling, typically if you, if you pick a random parameter, uh, there's all sorts of theory explaining that, but it's, it's, it's over parameterized in a, in, a, in, a, in a bad way. It has too much capacity. 
right? Physical quantum states that we're going to see in nature coming out of a quantum computer or, or well, coming out of a natural quantum systems uh, is a small subspace of the Hilbert space of all states, right? So having something that has capacity to hit, you know, close to any point in, in the unitary space, right? Something that could yield hard random um, unitaries if you sample them randomly, uh, that's, that's too strong capacity for a task. Again, you want to tune the capacity so you don't overfit if you overtrain or you keep the, the training uh, tractable. Uh, so there's, there's a notebook uh, studying that. I won't go too much into that. Uh, but yeah, the, the point is that uh, there's also a paper by David Poulain and, and uh, others that uh, studies the, um, you know, physical states, the illusion of the Hilbert space, right? The, the Hilbert space is a convenient uh, uh, mathematical framework, but the reality is that real states are always in an, an interesting subspace, right? So we want smarter um, Ansatz. So uh, I will link the slides um, and there's a notebook. Uh, this is kind of supporting background behind the notebook uh, presented in TF Quantum. Um, so how do you make uh, optimization of quantum neural networks easier? Well, you got to choose better models, right? You got to parameterize them better, right? So if you have information about oh, what's the topology or the layout of the system, the data I'm trying to understand, that's good. If I have the Hamiltonian uh, of the system and I'm trying to you know, uh, create a thermal state or a ground state, that's, that's useful information. Uh, is it uh, unitary evolution? I could use that. Um, so, so the idea is to have less parameters as much as possible and, and to use as much knowledge of the problem we can. It's not magic. You gotta, you gotta have some assumptions. So the idea is that, uh, you know, you can have quantum convolutional neural networks, which is like tying parameters across space Quantum graph neural networks is like using, uh, you know, knowledge that your system lives on a graph to to uh, to uh, induce a certain parameterization of your neural networks, and then quantum probabilistic generative models they're they're quite general, but in that case we're going to be focused on given a Hamiltonian generate a thermal state. So how much time do I have uh, left, um, Chris? Uh, you know, uh... Yeah, I mean, in the era of uh, COVID, there's no, yeah. <laughs> there's, okay. no there's no hard constraints. Um, uh, I mean, so we'll yeah. we'll post this on YouTube, so it'll be available for uh, for the whole world. So um, you just you just might see at you know say a eleven a couple people have to drop out. You might not yeah. even know, but yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. Okay, so I guess I could cover uh, all three of these uh, uh, if, if, if people are into it. Um, so, okay, so quantum convolutional neural networks. Uh, originally, it was a paper by uh, um, Misha Lukin, uh, now in Nature. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's basically also, you know, Giefer Vidal had a tensor network version of this uh, in, in the 2000s. Uh, which is called the MERA, multi-scale entanglement renormalization ansatz. But the idea is, again, you know, similarly, if you want to get to a compressed representation, you want to have a hierarchical kind of QNN architecture like this, and you downsample it. So you, you, you like throw out some qubits or you measure them and you do some feedback. And then you, you keep processing like this. But the idea is, if you notice, U1, 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 U2, 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 U2 it's you tie your parameters across space, right? So only one of these boxes, it's number of parameters is the total number of parameters for this layer, right? So they're all tied. In a sense, by like tying all these parameters, when you, when you take the gradient, I don't know if I'm on camera, but uh, <clears throat> when you take the gradient, you could kind of accumulate it through all of these copies of, of the parameters and it's additive because of, uh, uh, of the kind of product rule. Um, and, uh, and that kind of amplifies the gradient. So it, it, it kind of helps you in a sense, intuitively, uh, fight the finishing gradients. Uh, but the idea is these, these neural networks are good for condensed matter systems. They're good, you know, all, all around any translationally invariant system, right? Again, you have a symmetry in your system. Let's say it's a one dimensional chain and some condensed matter system. It's like, okay, well, my system's translationally invariant. So my, 
my representation, my computation to disentangle it, generate it, or, or, or find an interesting parameter should be translationally invariant. So then you instill that in your, your parameterization of the neural network. <clears throat> can, I, can I just uh, yeah. ask a question about that? So sure. um, does this uh, uh, adding in the measurement with the like yeah. feedback during the computation, does, does that affect anything? Because I thought before basically everything was just a, you know, a nice unitary circuit. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. this obviously introduces maybe some nonlinearities. Um, does that affect the ability to do this quantum backprop or? Uh, you could always delay, you could always see it as like, you know, you can always extend these cables to the end and say, you know, principle of like uh, deferred measurement. Uh, technically, yeah, these are just like a simple measurement and, and simple feedback. There's no, um, a, you know, complicated decision process of how to feedback here. So in the, in the actual implementation in CERC and, and, and TensorFlow Quantum, we, we just have an effective unitary here. Uh, between these two and then we we just start ignoring these qubits right okay. um so in a sense like yeah uh, measurement and feedback is a non-linearity in, in the hilbert space um but you know so is just tracing out stuff but when do you trace out things it's like well when you start not using them i guess um so yeah i guess uh um, sure. Yeah, quant uh, quantum error correction step. Yeah, you, you could always like coherently, well, not always, but like for certain uh, feedback schemes, you could do quantum error correction like in a coherent fashion. Uh, it's, not, it's not good for quantum error correction, but like, you know, theoretically. Um, <clears throat> yeah, but, but the important thing is that you downsample and you use less and less degrees of freedom, right? So the information has to like concentrate uh, about say a, an order parameter or a, a phase um, parameter. Um, Okay, so yeah, how how would this look like? You know, um, oh, this is a this is a multi-feature map quantum convolutional network, something we've dabbled with, uh, and it's in the example. Again, this is kind of a guide to the various examples uh, and notebooks that I encourage you to check out on the TensorFlow Quantum Research branch, uh, linked in the white paper and linked in the stack. Uh, but you, you'd have several data points, and then you can have several filters or several. Uh, quantum, different co quantum convolutional filters, right? Because this is, in a sense, it's a single filter sweeped across the board. And if you look at classical uh, convolutional neural networks, usually you have several filters. So you can imagine like this thing is going to learn effectively like one, one big measurement or, or one big complicated POVM. Uh, whereas, you know, if you have several of them then you can, and you aggregate their information or or combine them, then you could get more interesting information. And uh, so, and then if you have different feature maps from these different filters being applied, you could, it, it plugs in better with classical convolutional layers, which you could append and then put uh, fully connected layers and you could train the whole thing with hybrid backprop, right? So this is like the most overkill classifier <laughs> for uh, quantum data. Uh, but you know, convolutional networks are very successful classically. So it's important to have cool quantum classical versions. Um, but you know, the idea is that by hybridizing, you know, you, you can, let's say use a single layer. You could only use uh, this layer, for example, of the quantum circuit It has a higher chance of, of being executable, right. Uh, on, on near term devices. And then, you know, the idea is once, once you've disentangled a bunch of stuff, like in, in this case, not in the classical machine learning way of, call, uh, of uh, considering disentanglement, but in the literal quantum mechanical way, you could, if you've disentangled your information, it could be you know, mostly classical or almost classical, like your, your density matrix is almost diagonalized. And uh, in that case, you only need classical processing after that. Um, so the idea is, you know, as, as quantum computers get better, we can have more and more quantum layers but you know, there might be a point of dimin diminishing trade-off with more and more quantum depth. And then the idea is having the optional, you know, the option to hybridize, um, you know, allows you to get your value add from quantum and, and still have a, a good representation um, that is, is big enough and, and has high enough capacity because it has enough parameters and representation power to do your task, whether that's, uh, well, it's not classifying Schrodinger's cat, uh, but it's, it's classifying, um, 
uh, as in this picture, it, it's classifying phases of matter. And uh, I mean, whatever you want to classify. Um, you know, recently there's, there's been quantum sensing uh, classifiers, uh, QNNs uh, that have been put in the literature and so on. Uh, okay, so, so that's if your system's translationally invariant. What if it just lives on a graph? It's like a quantum internet graph or it's a, it's a condensed matter system. Uh, here we just do a, a basic kind of Hamiltonian learning with a, a certain uh, type of graph quantum neural network. The graph quantum neural network is just the usual way you parameterize quantum neural networks, um, you know, exponentials of generators, right? Because how do you parameterize unitaries? Unitaries are a Lie group. And, you know, how, how do you have a continuous family uh, in a Lie group? Then you define a generator in the Lie algebra and your parameterized family is the integral curve. So it's nice and easy to take derivatives, right? And uh, so the idea is if you define sequences of layers that are each Hamiltonians that are two local, so they live on a graph, right? If you have two local means like, you know, terms are, have at most support on, on two sites, then you could describe it as a graph, right? And then the idea is that you could just do Hamiltonian learning with gradient descent uh, here, right? And that's a, a special case. You could also do some, some interesting stuff. Like let's say I have a quantum network um, and you know, I want to have a, a circuit that you know, it's, it's, I do the same thing at each time step um, and it's translationally invariant. Uh, you know, can I create a GHG state globally by just doing local operations and without having to synchronize which operations we do and it would work on many networks. Uh, yeah, I mean, this, this application is not as interesting. Um, you could apply it to classical data. We, we did that just to check, you know, um, <laughs> you never know, you never know. You, you, you have to check with, with quantum neural networks. Um, and we, we applied it to clustering. Uh, and I think identifying these two graphs are isomorphic. It, it does pretty well, it does the job. Um, so you could, do, you could do the same job as a classical network. It just doesn't mean you should rent an expensive quantum computer to do that in my opinion. But, uh, uh, but yeah, so an exciting future, future direct direction of this is um, applying quantum graph neural networks to chemistry. And, uh, you know, again, a lot of people are focusing on, oh, what if I could simulate time evolution of chemistry? Uh, <laughs> it's going to take a large overhead, very large quantum computers that are error corrected. Uh, what if instead I could still get, you know, what it, what is the point of that, right? We're we're trying to get uh, targets, you know, free energy, energy frequencies, and and various things uh, from those simulations. So what if I could be able to have a quantum model that can predict similar things and allows us to represent, you know, entanglement and and some form of quantum dynamics, but that is much simpler, much smaller footprint, and much simpler on the quantum computer, right? If you have a simple quantum graph neural network, or, or in this paper that we're, we're using diagram here, it's a classical graph neural network that he's used. You, you plug in the biomolecular graph, and then it learns to predict energies and so on. So if we could find a workaround to having to do full-blown quantum simulation that scales as like the space-time volume of what you're trying to simulate to like simple data-driven, you know, quantum degrees of freedom on a graph and we learn couplings and so on. Uh, and we learn an effective, you know, uh, representation of a subspace or effective dynamics on a subspace that recovers the chemical properties, uh, then that's a big win. Um, so I didn't really explain too much what quantum graph nets were, but again, it's just exponentials of two local Hamiltonians really. That's the, <laughs> in a sequence, it's kind of, but we, we do relate it to, to like the, uh, in this case, to the classical version of graph uh, convolutional networks, like formally, um, but that's that's why we call them graph neural nets. Um, but but the idea is that these things train pretty well because we tied parameters here. We tied uh, parameters across time because we were doing repeated layers. We we're simulating a time evolution. Uh, here we tied across space. It's easy to train. Here we tied across space. Here too. Uh, so there's way less parameters to train, and when you tie parameters. Uh, again, you don't have vanishing gradients, right? So that's just another message with that, with that uh, graph neural net. 
Uh, okay, so let's get to the original topic of, of this talk, uh, right on time, um, which is uh, quantum probabilistic generative models, right? So we've seen how to hybridize feed forward neural networks and kind of feed forward quantum neural networks, right? And probabilistic machine learning deals with how to learn representations of distributions, right? It's, it's, it's really important for unsupervised learning and it's, it's beyond just having fun with classifiers, which is just what you do when you're, you're starting in, in, in ML, but the, the, the main problems are in semi-supervised and supervised learning. So the idea is instead of just marrying feed forward networks with quantum neural networks, can we combine quantum neural networks and probabilistic models uh, from classical theory, again, in a meaningful way. Um, so uh, typically in, in, in quantum generative models or, or you know, the typical example being the VQE, um, we have a pure state input and a pu parameterized pure state output, right? And we, you know, let's say we optimize the parameters of our uh, unitary quantum neural network, such as to minimize an expectation value, for example. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, so we get a pure state input, a pure state output, and we're learning to create a pure state at the output of our network. Uh, but you know, a lot of quantum states out there are not pure states. Uh, they are mixed states. So how do we deal with mixed states? Mixed states are mixtures of different quantum states. And so it would make sense that you know, the mixture, we, we figure out a way to do a mixture uh, that is classical and have a portion that is quantum. So the idea is to hybridize a parameterized, and I'm using, I'm being very abstract here because th there's a lot of flexibility what you can use here, but to have a, a probabilistic classical model that learns a classical, a purely classical probability distribution, right? Um, so P theta of X, theta are the parameters, X is like the sample, it could be a bit string, it could be a continuous parameter if it's in CV, but uh, you, you sample from your, your parameterized model and depending on those samples, you, you flip some bits, right? Um, and if you flip some bits, uh, according every time on average, you're, you're gonna get a mixed state. So you've converted a classical probability distribution into a mixed state like this. And it's gonna be a diagonal mixed state, right? And it's just gonna be like this. So it's effectively classical. Like it's entropy, uh, it's quantum entropy becomes classical entropy. There's all sorts of properties like that. And then, you know, okay, well, great. <laughs> we use a quantum computer to do bit flips. That's not, <laughs> that's not what we, we use them for. What we use them for really is, is this portion. Long unitary evolutions that are really hard to replicate, really hard to sample. Again, as was demonstrated say, in, in the quantum supremacy experiment. Uh, so if you tack on a, a unitary evolution that's parameterized and also trainable, then you get a, a hybrid model that theta parameters live in the classical model uh, and, and five parameters live in the QNN. And then you have a hybrid model for a mixed state, right? And uh, yeah, I mean, that's a, you know, hybrid uh, quantum probabilistic model for mixed states. But what can you do with mixed states? You could do a lot of things, right? Mixed states are actually, you know, the most general form of, well, there might be more general forms, but, uh, but they're not that, or I guess use day to day, they're the most useful form of, of uh, describing quantum states. Um, uh, so, so the idea, again, yeah, we, we have a classical diagonal uh, states and then it's sandwiched by unitaries like this because in the, you know, in the operator picture, you're going to do a uh, conjugation. Um, why should we care about mixed states, right? Well, um, you know, a lot of people are doing VQE, right? And that, that's great. And I think for like superconductors and stuff that's really cold, you know, a ground state is, a, is an important, you know, thing that is plausible to appear in nature or in a super cooled nature, um, like in our fridges. Um, but, you know, many systems in nature are at a finite temperature, right? And they're not always super cold, right? So, you know, the quantum effects might get washed out, but then the point is that if we have a hybrid model and we could tune the representation power that's classical versus quantum, then we could find the sweet spot where you have just enough quantum for the task at hand, right? But the idea is that, you know, various systems are at, at finite temperature, even if we just want to 
simulate systems at finite temperature, it's important to be able to model mixed states. Most quantum systems are open quantum systems, right? In nature, again, like whether you're looking at your quantum computer, it's not perfectly unitary in real life uh, or, or a quantum sensor or whatnot. So it's important to be able to model mixed states. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you look at any, any subsystem of a pure system, say you're doing ADS CFT or something like that because you do that on weekends, uh, you know, you're, if you look at a, a subregion and you want to compute its entropy, that's going to be a, a problem of a, a describing a mixed state, right? So if we want to have generative models or, or parameterized models uh, really help us do quantum mechanics and get value out of uh, studying quantum systems, then we need to be able to represent mixed states, right? So, you know, the VQE, Variational Quantum um, uh, Eigensolver, is one of the most popular methods. So here we present the Variational Quantum Thermalizer which uh, in its most general form is you have a probabilistic you know, neural network, something that outputs a, a parameterized uh, distribution um, and you sample it and then you control some bit flips as we saw, you apply the unitary and that's, that's the output of your model. At, at this point, you're trying to get a thermal state output here. So how do you do that? What is the thermal state? Well, if you're given a, a, a Hamiltonian H and a target inverse temperature beta, you're trying to generate this state where this is just the normalization constant called the partition function uh, over here. So you're trying to create the exponential, right? The, the, and this is not a complex exponential. It's a real exponential. It's funky, right? It's, it's not, you know, native to your quantum computer usually. Um, for some reason, quantum computers, they like to evolve in real time, but not imaginary time, right? That's another way to put it, but uh, it's more physics -y language. In any case, we have our variational hybrid model for, for uh, this, uh, this thermal state. And uh, you know, the loss function that we're gonna minimize, and you could derive why this is, uh, this is the best loss function from the quantum relative entropy between your model and the targeted thermal state, uh, the terms that depend on your parameters are this, and they're you know, proportional to the, something called the free energy of, of your, your model, right? And it's the energy, you know, expectation of energy minus entropy, you know, and there's factors of beta in there. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so there, there's, there's two ways to approach this. If you have a very simple model and it lives on your classical computer, you can know the entropy analytically, right? If it's like a product of Bernoulli's or something like that. And so you could get this, this uh, you know, analytically on your classical computer. And again, this is the loss function graph you have the energy expectation, you need the quantum computer, but the entropy, you know, on the classical computer, right? So in those cases, you could just take the gradient directly. And because this is an expectation value of an observable, we all know how to take gradients of that. It's just the usual Q and N gradients. So you know how to take gradients of both of these parameters. Um, unfortunately, I was gonna add another slide on how to derive the gradients, but I would uh, advise you to check out the TensorFlow quantum paper. We have the formula for the gradients of this for a general model. But the idea is that for simple models, you could get the loss function, you could get the entropy directly um, for simple classical models. And for other models, you, you won't necessarily be able to get the entropy easily, but you'll get the gradient easily. Um, and the gradient ends up being a, a simple formula of, of, of uh, how to sample from the quantum computer. So in both cases, we can, you know, we can have these hybrid models that allow us to uh, create approximate thermal states. So do these things work, right? And, uh, you know, here we have uh, a model for a superconductor. Uh, it's a fermionic model. Whoops. Um, and we, we, we plot kind of the, I think it's the, the correlation function, the covariance matrix or some fermionic version of it um, over, over iterations um, and uh, over training iterations. So at zero, you know, our guess is completely scrambled. And at the end, it ends up looking a lot like the target. And uh, our training loss goes down. So another thing I want to mention is that um, the VQE is interesting, not just for the output quantum state, but the value at which your, your training ends is an approximation to the ground state energy. This algorithm, you know, the output value when your training ends, if you had a good parameterized model and it had right capacity, trained well, all these things we've been talking about, then it should equilibrate to the free energy of the system. The, the free energy of the true, if you had this thing in nature, 
get a, a thermal state, you get the free energy, which is itself a useful quantity to know. Um, and so, uh, and in the, in the limit of beta, sorry, in the limit of beta goes to infinity, so temperature goes to zero, then, you know, I, I mean, if you multiply by one over beta, this term relative to this term just vanishes, so it just becomes VQE, right? So this is really a generalization of the VQE. Um, and uh, at least to me, you know, every system has a, eh, has a bit of temperature, you know? So why not, why not uh, upgrade? you know, VQ to VQT, I'm being a salesman here, but uh, yeah. So, so the idea is, yeah, you could apply it to uh, spins and uh, bosons and uh, we, we tested a bit of everything in, in, in the original paper. And, you know, does training the relative entropy also gives you uh, convergence and trace distance and fidelity and there's bounds on that, but we wanna check the answer is yes, so we're good. Um, you know, we converge onto our, our target. So, now we just described if like a quantum simulation task, but it's not, it wasn't, well, it is quantum machine learning in the sense that you, you have a parameterized representation and you train it, but it was more like optimization. So what if, what if we want to learn from data, right? And we want to use this machinery as like our generative model, but then we also need to find a way to take, take in data, right? Instead of knowing a Hamiltonian. So again, uh, we have our, our quantum probabilistic model like this, uh, we call them quantum Hamiltonian based models in this case, because if you pick your, your probability distribution to be a classical energy based model. So an energy based model is just a distribution that we parameterize in the log space and we call that thing energy, right? The log of the distribution, not the normalization. So we parameterize an energy and then we force our distribution to be the thermal, the classical Boltzmann distribution or classical thermal distribution of this energy. And there's algorithms for inference, uh, whether it's on discrete space or continuous space to do that sampling, that sampling of exponentials given an energy or given a log, right? And we want to leverage those. Uh, but if you have a quantum probabilistic generative model and you use an energy based model in the latent space like this, we call it a quantum Hamiltonian based model. Why? Uh, well, We'll see in a second, but it's because you're effectively parameterizing a quantum Hamiltonian and your guess for how to model your data is a parameterized class of thermal states. Um, so we took inspiration from classical or modern, I guess, energy-based models. There's been Boltzmann machines, you know, with spins for a long time, but uh, there's also more recent work um, uh, with using from OpenAI using neural networks to parameterize an energy function. So if you have a differentiable function and you parameterize a function from your input space to a scalar, that creates you know a scalar function defined on a space. It gives you a potential, and then you could do stuff like Hamiltonian Monte Carlo or Markov chain Monte Carlo to get some samples or, or stochastic gradient Langevin dynamics. There's a bunch of algorithms. It's a it's a whole library. Uh, TensorFlow probability. <laughs> That's uh, another library. Um, but, but the, yeah, it's, it's just, it's an interesting parameterization for, for all sorts of reasons uh, that are pretty fundamental, but I won't get into those into the, in this talk, maybe some other day. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, the idea is the, these energy-based models are pretty powerful. They're as powerful as like GANs or VAEs. Uh, this is like them, you know, in painting or, 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 uh, trying to figure out uh, how to denoise images and so on, and they're composable. They're just really cool, you know. Sometimes you just do stuff because it it is cool. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but in our case, in the quantum physics case, if you plug in a a energy based model for your classical model, what you get is your your parameterized class of mixed states looks like this. It is a parameterized. Um, so this operator is diagonal because it's a classical function uh, described by a neural network. And then the, uh, these things are quantum neural networks and put together, you have a parameterized Hamiltonian that you train the parameters of the Hamiltonian. And when you're doing prediction or inference, you are, uh, you're sampling from the thermal state generated by kind of the VQT kind of model for, for that Hamiltonian. Um, and similarly, you know, that's what the, that's what energy based models do. They, they have a parameterized neural network for this landscape. They shape the landscape so that samples like this from these algorithms replicate the samples from the data set. 
And this is what this means. This is what the sampling means. Like imagine this, but in how, however many pixel dimension uh, space, right? You know, if it's 512 by 512, that's the number of dimensions this is happening, this sampling. Um, okay, they're just cool because again, you could learn a Hamiltonian. Uh, you could learn a Hamiltonian given data. So if you're given a thermal state, this thing's gonna actually learn a, an operator um, uh, representation of your, your, uh, your log of your, your data, right? And learning the log has its also, has its uses. It's kind of cool for other reasons. Uh, so, okay, so here's a task of what we call quantum modular Hamiltonian learning. Modular Hamiltonian, again, is just like the energy it's like the log, the quantum log up to normalization. So we're trying to learn that so that we can, you know, if you learn the log, then you could do the VQT for the exponential, and then you've just replicated your data set, right? Okay. Uh, and why do we go to log space and back? It's because when you're trying to train on like fundamental, you know, um, metrics of how well you're doing that are, you know, relative entropy, quantum relative entropy, there's a bunch of logs everywhere. So it's actually really convenient to have an explicit expression that you can measure for your, your log operator, right? So, so the idea is this. So you have a, a, a data set, you have some parameters that you're trying to train to find so that your parameterized model approximates your data set mixed state. You have your parameterized model, Hamiltonian based model, we already know this. If you do the relative entropy and ignore terms that don't depend on your parameters, you get cross entropy, which is this expectation value of your data with respect to the log operator. And it's cool because you can measure it plus the log partition function, um, which is important. Uh, and the idea is you could train this again, you could get nice clean gradients. Uh, it's actually very simple. And what's cool is that you can evaluate this expectation value by feeding your data through the QNN, the U dagger. So in reverse, and then you sample it. And then theoretically, if you have an, a classical neural network parameterizing the diagonal, you just feed those bit strings through the classical neural network, and then you average from the sampling. And then you'll get the expectation value of this fancy uh, Hamiltonian. And then you could feed that to your loss function. And you could get gradients the good old fashioned way with hybrid quantum classical backprop. Um, and this allows you to learn mixed states, which is, which is really cool. Uh, and I don't know, that, I, 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 think, I think it's, it's quite fun. Um, and again, gradient formulas uh, work out. I don't have them here, but uh, check out the TensorFlow quantum paper. Again, we, we kind of tried the inverse task. Once we had a thermal state, can you learn uh, you know, Hamiltonians? Can you learn to replicate the, the data states? Uh, and we checked. Um, here, it, it was... It was interesting because we were like, how much can we get away with? How much does the classical computer versus the quantum computer do? If you have a simple distribution, that's just a tensor product of Bernoulli distributions. So like Bernoulli distributions are just bias coins, right? If you have a tensor product of bias coins for your classical distribution, and then you have a quantum circuit, can you learn various thermal states? And it turns out that there's like a certain region of parameters that it, it's not very good at approximated. So you, you do need, you do need a more complicated classical model uh, in, in certain regions of parameter space to learn data, which was really interesting because, um, yeah. Uh, so we also did some stuff with bosons, trying to find compression codes. Can we like, like um, if, if you find a, a, a decorrelated representation and you rank kind of each uh, mode, in this case it's modes instead of qubits, by like the, their entropy in latent space, and you throw out the low entropy modes because they're not jiggling enough. So, the, you know, they're not, they don't have a lot of information. They have low variance. Then you've effectively found a compression code. Um, and so you could throw out, you know, 10%, 40%. Okay, at 70%, you're starting to have lost 90% of your stuff. Uh, you, you know, that doesn't work out. But the idea, again, is just like you could, you could do all sorts of stuff with this. You could do classifiers. You could do compressed representations. You could uh, model things. Um, it's just an important building block of unsupervised uh, machine learning and, and we've extended to quantum machine learning. So it's an exciting time, lots to do with this. And uh, yeah, no next week's lecture. So <laughs> I'm just gonna thank everyone um, for, for, this, uh, for attending this talk. Um, uh, hopefully give you, I know it was a lot, but um, you know, hopefully you got something out of all of this and uh, 
you know, you could reach me via email, no spam, please. But, uh, you know, if you have legitimate questions, happy to answer it. Uh, I didn't cover examples in TF Quantum. I don't think we have a lot of time, but I will share a link to the slide deck and it has a bunch of links that you could uh, check out and work through the notebook tutorials yourself. Um, and I encourage you all to, uh, you know, explore quantum machine learning. It's a nascent field. I would advise, you know, focusing on the areas that, you know, as scientists and from first principles, we expect to have quantum advantages. And to me, where I'm looking is, is quantum data learning and quantum data processing. Um, and there, there's all sorts of interest out there to, to have QML be this, be that, and make you coffee in the morning and everything. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's it, for me, just if we can find areas where quantum machine learning is, is valuable and gives us insights uh, into our world uh, or various systems out there, I think that's, that's the big win. So on that note, uh, yeah, uh, Chris. All right, I'll give you the applause. There's, a, I'm sure, a resounding applause in Sydney. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, that was excellent. Uh, thanks. Uh, you covered a lot, um, yeah. a lot of material. Um, and I, what, there was a, a, it seemed to me there was a, like a, a transition there between, um, well, the generative models and then the, yeah, the non, the non generative models. Um, and, and is this, a, so I think most people who are just kind of get a little bit of information here or there about the field um, certainly know some like more of the high profile um, uh, blog posts or, or papers about um, why it might not be a good area. Like for example, the, uh, you know, the read the fine print paper about, um, preparing quantum data. Um, but it seems to me like in the, for most, if not all generative uh, model applications, that that's not an issue because you know, you're not encoding classical data into quantum state. Is that that's true? Right. Yeah, what I mean by quantum data is the output of a simulation or uh, you know, someday there will be ways to get data from the real world onto a quantum computer. And uh, you could you could look, you could process that you know just like we take pictures in the real world and we upload them to a cloud to do ML. Uh, I think I think that's what the future holds. But um, you know, for example, if you if you're trying to do quantum process tomography or something like that, or you have a um, you know that that is quantum data that is the quantum process you're trying to estimate, you could use parameterized models for that. Um, so. I, I think we had a, a little intro in the TensorFlow quantum paper of like, you know, in quantum communication, you know, an error channel uh, that's, uh, that's quantum data and quantum sensing, uh, you know, your pointer states, when, once, you, once you apply the signal on it, you have a, an embedded hidden parameter in your state, how to extract it best, how to extract information about the hidden parameter. Um, that's another example of quantum data that we have now. Yeah, outputs of quantum simulators, analog simulators, um, digital simulators, right? Sometimes you want to just, you know, do post-processing or extract something from your, the output of your simulation. So, for example, in the, in the Lucan um, ConvNet, his example was, you know, the output of a, you, you plug in the output of an analog quantum simulator, but theoretically you could output, you know, a VQE model and then that gives you the thermal state or you know, maybe the result of a time evolution and then you plug it into this to extract the order parameter. Um, so you know, just like in, in the classical machine learning, you can have data in a simulation, right? DeepMind likes to play games, for example, or you can have data from the real world, right? But for the algorithms portion, it doesn't matter where it came from, it's just data and you're trying to learn it. Um, but I imagine we can have a future where we have both. Uh, from simulators and from the real world. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? Just unmute yourself. Don't forget. Cool. Um, while they think of questions, I have lots. Uh, <laughs> great, 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 great. 
Go for it. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, I, I guess the 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 way that you kind of uh, were, were motivating the research was, I, I don't remember if you said exactly this, but you, you I thought you said something like, um, let's not worry so much about speed ups, right? Let's not focus on speed ups because we have these other sort of um, measures of success in in machine learning. Um, mm. So uh, I guess what I meant there was, let's not focus on um, trying to beat classical ML at a classical task and focusing on speed ups for that because sure. there's a bigger market for that. Let's focus on tasks that are just quantum computers have the home turf advantage in a sense. And it's very hard to plug in quantum data into a classical computer. Sure. Um, and I guess that's, that's where I was going with that. But yeah, if you have another part to your question. Yeah. Yeah. So that, uh, this, I guess the second part of the question was, um, so are we, uh, have, when will we be at the point where then um, that like quantum quantum machine learning will be like um, uh, like I don't, I don't know how to say it, useful I don't want to say useful but but, um, but yeah. there's some measure of of like um, uh, of of usefulness like when will uh, when will we be you know using them with the same ubiquity that we're using classical techniques. Ah, it, ubiquity that... of classical. Yeah, okay. I mean, I think that classical, I think as long as we don't have as many quantum problems or companies studying quantum problems as we have companies studying classical data, I I just don't think, you know, again, it's, it's going to, for example, like GPUs used to just be used for graphics. And it's like, do you have computer graphic problems? Right. But now, now they now that they got really large and really high performance and kind of caught up to CPUs, uh, now they're kind of used across the board for all sorts of stuff. Um, so similarly, I think quantum computers are going to be a, a niche specialized thing for quantum simulation and QML on uh, quantum data. Uh, you know, quantum assisted engineering, right? Trying to understand or design devices uh, that are quantum. Uh, using quantum computers. Um, but I think that to compete with classical computing in a serious manner, where you're really saying, you know, you should use a quantum computer for this, uh, it's going to be lower overhead and not just like, because, uh, because time, you know, if, if you approach a business, uh, it, it's, it's about time and, and cost, right? And uh, we have a long way to go before I could say, um, yeah, I mean, you should solve this business problem with a quantum computer. Absolutely. Uh, it's going to be lower cost and, and save you time and give you better results. We're not there yet, but um, it's a big question. Uh, and this is my own opinion, not that of anyone else, but this is, it's a big question whether NISC uh, computing, um, you know, non-error corrected uh, quantum computers can be useful. Uh, there's a lot of research efforts in this, in this area. Um, I'm, I used to be pessimistic. I have a brief moment of optimism in the near term. I'm going to try a few things, but, uh, but if that doesn't work, I don't, yeah, we'll see. Maybe we'll need error correction, but it's going to be a continuum because we're going to have NISC and then we're going to have, you know, early partial fault tolerance, full fault tolerance, right? Um, and uh, partial fault tolerance, I would say is, is more like um, if you right. don't have enough for magic state distillation, but you still do, Clifford error correction, so on. Um, and, you know, that's going to help a lot because for now we can't even swap things on a chip without losing a lot of fidelity. Um, and so we're kind of stuck always doing these, what are called hardware efficient Q and N's, which are just like, <laughs> just do a bunch of random pulses for the parameters that you have in your chip layout, which is great to show that it's hard to sample, but it's, it's, um, it's not ideal for, as we saw, like quantum machine learning, these QNNs have horrible gradients. And, and then the problem is if you have structure in your, in your logical kind of quantum neural network uh, onsets or parameterization, then you're gonna have to swap things around and then you're gonna lose fidelity. So, 
yes, a lot of the literature is focused on these hardware efficient onsets and we know it's not scalable, but at the same time, we're stuck doing that in the near term NISC. But um, so we're, we're, we're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. Um, but I mean, overall, I'm, I'm optimistic that QML will be useful in the early days of, of uh, maybe some, some cool demos, I would say, in, in NISC. And then, uh, you know, truly useful um, in the early days of with only partial fault tolerance. I wouldn't say it needs like full fault tolerance. I think you can have relatively low depth circuits um, and you can take many shots. Um, and so uh, even if there's some errors in say your T gates or your RZ gates, um, it's still, it's still going to do decently. Um, that's just my opinion though. <laughs> it's, it's an intuition, but uh it's hard to tell. That's the million dollar question, right? There's a million dollar bounty by, I think, Rigetti or something for right. useful quantum algorithms. So, yeah. Yeah. I was just trying to get the million dollars, to be honest. Yeah, that's right. Chris, All right. Well, thank you very much for the talk. Um, um, and um, yeah, well, hopefully Thanks. we'll see more coming out of, out of the, uh, the group. All right. Well, thanks for inviting me. And uh, yeah, apologies for the technical difficulties at the beginning and uh yeah thanks thanks so much to chris for for having me and uh unfortunately i don't get to like hang out in the uh at the coffee uh station in, in sydney that'd be cool someday i should visit um but uh yeah someday someday i'll be back and and uh visit down there down under that'd be great so all right thanks for having me uh cheers <laughs>